Let's stand together as we open our Bibles to the book of Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30. You know, there are certain themes that they just don't seem to go together. Children may be dismissed, yes. They didn't need my permission. Fours and fives out the back door and first through sixth out that door over there. There, Many of these kids are heading to camp this week. We pray for them, by the way, as they go to camp. Many important decisions. I made some of the most important decisions of my life at camp. I was talking to a parent one time, I, and they were talking about how expensive camp is. <laughs> and I remember saying, well, it's cheaper than bail. <laughs> and for some kids, it might be that difference. Um, so we need to make sure that we pray for our kids this week. I'm going to read um, two different passages in Proverbs 30, and then we're going to come back to them, and I'm going to deal with them in reverse order. Um, so two different passages in Proverbs chapter 30. Um, the first one we're going to read is verses 7 through 9. It says two things. Have I required of thee, or do I demand of thee, or am I praying for of thee? Um, it's a prayer. This is a prayer. Deny me them not before I die. Remove far from me vanity, emptiness, and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient or appropriate for me. Lest I be full and deny thee and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. And then verse 15 the horse leech, or simply the leech, has two daughters crying, give, give. There are three things that are never satisfied. Yea, four things say not is enough. The grave, the barren womb, the earth that is not filled with water, and the fire that saith, that saith not it is enough. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you bless your word now. I pray that you help us to understand the truths that are here. And Lord, I pray that you'll help us to live lives content. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Apostle Paul said, I know how to be abased, live with nothing, and how to abound, live with a lot. In fact, he said, I have learned in whatsoever state, wherever I am, whatever situation I am in, in my life, I will be content. Isn't it fascinating that we're talking about contentment as we're also talking about suffering? Now, there, different people have different ways of viewing life, right? So I, I'm just going to tell you, uh, as I was preparing this message this week, um, this is one of those that, you know, preaches to me first and maybe most, and then you kind of get in on it later on. Because there, there are people, there for, we'll talk about how people view life. Some people view life as an opportunity to have fun. I mean, everything is an opportunity to have fun. Now, this is often a childlike way to view life. Everything is about play. We're going to play in the car on the way to vacation. We're going to play when we're at home. We're going to play while we're supposed to be doing homework. We're going to play do, uh, uh, doing our chores. I remember talk, Dave Sproul, I worked for him one time, uh, for a number of different times in years past. He was an evangelist, the father of one, my best friend. And, uh, one of the things he used to do was buy houses and fix them up and sell them again. And uh, So I learned to go paint houses and he'd pay us to do, you know, do stuff like that. And Mike and I would go work. And he'd come in and he'd look at us and he'd say this, talking about boys and fun. He'd say, you, you hire one boy, you get a boy. You hire two boys, you get half a boy. You hire three boys, you have no boys at all. You know, life can all be about fun. For some of you, life is about the drama. I mean, you love the emotion of life and all the different things that you go through and the highs and the lows and all, you know, you just love the drama. And if you can't get enough in your own life, then you're watching the movies and you're just getting into all it. You just love all of that stuff. There are some of you, life is all about relationships. 
It's about relationship with this person and that person. You just love people. And then there are, and I think there are a lot of men especially with this one. Life, you kind of view life, and here I am, as sort of as a problem to be solved. You know what I'm talking about? You know, every, uh, it, you know, it's a, it's, you know, the, I, I have to endure this. And some of you, life is problems that you just have to endure. But there are other folks, you know, life is a problem. Everything, you know, it's a problem that's going to be solved. And I really feel bad for you wives that are married to such men. It's hard to have a conversation without him trying to fix everything rather than just listen. But that's the way we... That's the way often we tend to view things. We tend to look at life as all of these problems to be solved. Of course, the older you get, there are some problems. That, I mean, that's, this is, when, when you men, when you view life as a problem to be solved, you are the ones who are most vulnerable to what they call a middle age crisis or mid age crisis. You know what I'm talking about? You know why that is? Because you start to come up with problems that you know you'll never be able to solve. You're never going to get any younger. That hair is never going to grow back again. <laughs> and as you get older, you have to start to come to grips with, their, with their, the fact that there are things in life that we can't resolve. In fact, sometimes the solutions are worse than the problems. And we were always wanting to fix things, always want more, always want this, always want that, always want to make things better, always have to have it different. In fact, isn't it interesting? We are in a country that has more conveniences, more technology, more wealth available to us than any time ever in all of human history. Are people today content? And you know, I mean, we look at our culture around us, and you look at people want more, they want Less, they, you know, the solution is more stuff. And then they get all that stuff and they realize, I, all, this, all this stuff is my problem, so they want less stuff. And now we're going to do with less stuff. And we want, and, you know, the government has to do all of these things for us. And the government should do nothing, none of these things for us. And, uh, you know, life will be better if we can just have, we can just sexually do whatever we want. We have no limitations. And then you have all of that. And then you realize that there are consequences of that. And there were just... There is this level of constant discontent. Now, I understand this in the world. I understand this out in the culture. And one of the reasons I understand it out in the culture is because every human being has a God-shaped hole that only the God of heaven, through his son Jesus Christ, can fill. And so there is this thirst and of course, there is the blindness also of, the, of, the, of being un, uh, an unbeliever that competes with all of that. And so we're in this battle for souls. But let's, so maybe that's someone here. You have been searching for something. You have looked for the joys of life in stuff and looked for the joys of life in adventure and adrenaline and substances and you know, all different kinds of things, money, uh, advancement, fame. I mean, you've been looking for all of those things, and nothing is ever satisfying. One of the allures of wanting to be rich is that most people don't get to be rich, so they don't realize that when they do become rich, it doesn't satisfy. But when you talk to the people who have gotten it, they will say, it doesn't fix your problems. So maybe you're one of those people. Let me tell you, the solution to that longing is Jesus. He's the one that can fix the hunger of your soul. But let's talk about you, believers. It's important for us as believers not to revert to a type of thinking that tends to make us not content. 
In fact, there's, there are entire false religions and false doctrine that are built on the idea that people are not content. There's, we call it the prosperity gospel. And it's being preached around the world. It's preached on the airwaves, on television, on radio. More television than radio, but it's preached over and over again. And there are the, the leaders of the prosperity gospel across this country. And it's, it, we have now exported that whole thing to South America and Africa. And it's all around the world. It's in, it, everywhere I go around the world, it's the Philippines where, um, you know, all, all different types of places where people are saying, you know, if you just, if you just follow God and you obey him and you have faith in him, he's going to make you rich. And these people around the world say, well, I, we can be like the Americans and have all of this stuff. But would they see how unhappy you are or how unhappy we are as a nation? And it's, a, it's an entire gospel built on the lack of contentedness of human beings. So here's what I want to ask you as a believer today. Are you content. Or is there an anxiousness in your soul all the time? I've got to have more. I got to have this. I got to if if I if I can just get that position in the company then everything will be okay. If I can just get to this certain level of income, then everything will be okay. The Apostle Paul said, I have learned in whatsoever state I am to be content. So let's talk about being content. One important theme in this chapter is the subject of greed and contentedness. It's an important theme that is evident throughout the book. This is written, by the way, I want you to think about this for a moment. This, this section, maybe it's a continuation of the, the words of Agur, but it's written by you know, the editor of this book, maybe, the, maybe Solomon himself. We see him and his wisdom throughout this book. Maybe the, the person who was the most wealthy person ever of the ancient times. I mean, if there was any person who had it all, it was Solomon. He was smart. He was wise. He had all the stuff he needed. He, he led a country that was not at war. He, I mean, for all of Solomon's reign, he was be dealing basically with peacetime and time of prosperity. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines. You say, well, that was a problem. Yeah, it was a problem. You know, I don't know how that all worked. But if there was ever a person who should have been content, it was Solomon. But then we come and read Ecclesiastes. And we find this older Solomon looking back upon his life. So, let's talk about contentedness. Two commands here if you're going to be content. The first one is you have to turn from something and turn to something. That's like you know, the Bible doctrines of repentance and faith. You repent. You repent of dead works. You repent of, that's what the, the false source of trust for the Jews. You repent of, of following idols. That was the false source of trust for the, uh, for, for the Gentiles. You, and today, what do people, should people repent of? Well, I think there's a sense in which you repent of your sin because it is the people's love of sin that keeps them from embracing a love for God. So you turn from that idolatry of sin. It's not you stop sinning and get saved, but you, return from, you turn from that idolatry. And so what do we turn from here? Well, first of all, we, return, we repent of greed. And so let's take a look at the second passage that we looked at first, and that's abandoning greed. Verses, th um, verses uh, 15 and 16. Here's what it says. The leech has two daughters. By the way, you notice that word? Crying. Notice that word crying in your text? And now notice it's in italics. I don't know if, if you understand what that means, but um, what it means is that that word is added to help us understand it's not in the original. I tend to think 
He's saying here, the horse, the horse leech has two daughters. They're named Give and Give. The names of the two daughters are Give and Give. And so let's talk about that for a moment. First of all, why would you name two daughters Give and Give? Why would you ta- name two daughters the same thing? I was looking back through the... Um, My lineage, my ancestry, um, there, there were a lot of shawls in the past with a lot of children. And I was go- back into the, oh, late 1700s as we go back into Germany. And, there, and we had w- w- one of those names. I, I'm trying to convince one of my kids that maybe it'd be a good idea to use it. Gottlieb. Good old German name, Gottlieb. And I don't know why they named their child Gottlieb, but they named a child Gottlieb. And then I noticed in the list of children in the family, there were two sons named Gottlieb. Now, why would you name two sons the same thing? Now, you know, sometimes you run out of names. My dad's name is Ivan. He has an older brother named John. Think about that for a moment. I don't know if you know this, but Ivan is the Russian form of John. So it's kind of like having a Two brothers, one named John and one named Juan. (laughs) My grandmother didn't know the difference. She just heard the name on the radio. Um, In fact, it was the, he was, she heard the name on the radio and she liked it. And then all all of his siblings, because he's the youngest. You know, when you get the last of 12 kids, you start running out of names. And so she heard the name on the radio. It turned out that in the radio program that they were listening to, Ivan was the villain. In the, they said, you can't name him Ivan. He's the villain. And she said, no, that's what I like. Name. I like that name. And she named him Ivan, and he was Ivan the rest of his life. But the horse leech has two daughters, give and give. Now, why did, why did he name Gottlieb and Gottlieb? Well, what I found out is that the first Gottlieb died when he was about a year old, and so they had another child later on, and they just reused the same name. I guess they just really liked the name. But the point here is you don't name two kids the same thing, which is, the, the, the point is this. There's only one thing a leech cries. Give, give, give. There's only one thing, only one thing a leech is, is give, give. In fact, have you heard the term, there's someone is a leech? Now, one of the reasons that, you know, we, we say, uh, uh, and we t- call a leech because uh, if you look up a leech, it is this blood-sucking worm. That's what a leech is. Doesn't that sound appealing? And we use that, there's a, it's, a, it's, it's blood-sucking. It just is taking, 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 not giving anything back. In fact, the idea of calling someone a leech who always takes and takes and takes and never gives, that analogy, that the, using the reason we use the word that way, probably comes from this passage. It's probably Proverbs that uses that analogy first. And so, greed is like a leech, a blood-sucking worm that attaches to you. Has two daughters, give me more, give! By the way, something that gives and never gives back, never returns a favor, only takes. The point of this is that greed, when it fills your heart, is never satisfied. It always, never content, never satisfied, always wants more, always wants more. And then he gives us these four things. In verse 15 and 16, he says, there, 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 are, there are three things that are sad, never satisfied, yea, four things that say not is enough. And then he talk, talks about the grave, grave, the barren womb, the earth that is not filled with water, and the fire that saith not is enough. Now, let's talk about the analogy first. He says four, then five. Usually, what it, or three, then four. What it usually means is that there are three, but the fourth is really, we're going to pay really attention to the fourth. Some scholars have just asked, well, why is... Why is this list here? How does this list apply to what he just said? I think the point is he's just using three illustrations, not necessarily bad or good, in which it's, there's never fullness, never satisfaction. And he talks about, for, for instance, the grave, that 
Death is never a thing where it says, okay, it's enough. No more people have to die anymore. He talks about the barren womb. In ancient times, having children was a blessing from God. The idea, the very idea of birth control in ancient times was crazy. Because people not only wanted to have children, they wanted to have many children. We can, you don't even have to be in ancient times. You can come even up into the early part of the 20th century in the United States of America. If you lived on the farm, the more kids you had, the better it was. The more cheap labor you had on the farm, and there were those people that could take care of you in your old age, passing from one generation to the next. Your, your entire social security system was your kids. It wasn't the government, it was your kids. And you enjoyed seeing your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren and seeing that from generation to the next. That was the sense of blessing. And he said, it wasn't like, well, I have to take care of them all. No, you taught them to take care of themselves. And not only did they take care of themselves, they took care of you. And so you never see people in the Bible complaining about, I have too many kids. Not once. You do see some concerned about the fact that they have no children, Sarah and Hannah in particular. And so there was, he's using this example of that type of longing that those people in that time would greatly understand. So he says the grave, the barren womb, and then he talks about the earth. The earth that is never completely saturated with water. You say, well, Pastor Shaw, you haven't lived in... <laughs> I think Florida, or you haven't lived in Georgia, some of these places, you know, I know what it looks like to have earth saturated with water. It rains all the time, and the water's wet, everything's wet all the time. Just understand, though, this writer's not writing about that part of the world. He's writing about a part of the world that's like us. You know, how many, you've, you, have you ever had people travel out here to visit you? And isn't it amazing how often people visit from the Midwest or someplace else and they come when it's raining? Now, I don't know. We have like 300 days of sunshine a year, but they come when it's raining. And, I, and they'll say, wow, it's raining. I can't believe it. And every Arizonan will look at them. This is what I say all the time. We never apologize for rain. Because that thirsty ground that, here, that is here is, ne is never satisfied with enough water. You say, well, but we have flash floods. That's because it is so dry, it's initially so hard for it to absorb the water. But the more it rains, the more it can. I don't know if we could put enough water into this ground. To saturate it. it is, the ground is thirsty. But then he uses that last one. And the last example of that insatiable thing is fire. Because here's the thing. The more you feed a fire, the bigger it gets. And the bigger it gets, the more fuel it wants. There's no fire that just says, well, I've had enough. It goes, and it goes, and it goes. L let me ask you a question. And, and, and this is really important for you to think about. Because there are times when, when it is okay to need something and desire something. We're going to talk about it in a moment. Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread. You say, well, you know, Pastor Shaw, we had another child, and the house is a little bit too small, and we, I, we'd like to have a little bit bigger house. Um, how do you know when you've gone from asking God to meet a need to covetousness or greed? One of the characteristics of greed is this. It's never enough. 
It's just, it's just never enough. You, you have this house that God has given you, and you see another one, and you say, whoa, that's beautiful. I really would like that one. You get that one. Well, there's, a, there's somebody else is living in this one. Well, I'd like that one. Then somebody else is living in this one. Yeah, and it's always something more, something more. Got to have more. Got to have more. If you just get the next thing, that'll make you satisfied. If you just get, you get one more thing, that'll make you satisfied. John Rockefeller said, somebody asked one, one time, John Rockefeller, how much more money do you have to have? He says, just a little bit more than I have now. It's always more. It's more. It's more. It's give. It's give. It's give. Abandon greed. And you say, well, how do I know? Well, we've looked at some biblical principles. Are you always desiring more and more? What's your response when God says no? And then we embrace contentedness. And so let's go back to verse 7. Let's talk about what contentedness is. He says, Two things have I required of thee, Deny them not before I die. And what are the two things? First of all, remove vanity and lies and give me neither poverty or riches. Um, those two things. And then he expands on the poverty or riches. So we're going to talk about contentedness from this passage. Let's, let's talk about what contentedness is, first of all. Um, uh, no, well, let's talk about protection from lies, the first question. He says protection from lies. This is not, by the way, notice what he says. <coughs> two things have I required from thee before I die. You get the impression that this is a person that is midlife or later. And looking at, okay, what is really important to me in this last section of life? Now, what would people pray for in the last section of their lives? Lord, give me good health throughout my life. Lord, what do we, this is some, one of the things we pray for. Pray for God to take away the pain. I, I hate to tell it to you, those of you that are a little bit younger, getting older hurts <laughs> at times. But he doesn't pray to take away from the pain. He doesn't pray for no trouble, no difficulties, anything like that in life. Here's what he prays for. He prays for removal from him, emptiness and lies. No protection from pain. Pain, many times we'd rather know lies than pain, right? Many, there are many times we'd rather have someone lie to us than tell us something that is painful or hurts us. This doesn't mean do we have to know everything. It does mean that he wants to be protected from frivolousness, the things in life that don't really matter, and being lied about. You know, it's, it's amazing how the older you get, the more some things in life just don't matter that much. Things that were really really important to you now don't seem so important. <laughs> I hate to say this, but it's true. Um, for much of my adult life, especially in those early years, I was a sports fan, particularly a Suns fan. The older I get, the less interested I am. Now, part of that's their fault, but that's a different story. <laughs> so, you know, but, you know, the football and the basketball and the baseball really was never a thing. But, you know, football and basketball and all those things, you know, just, you know, even, even like hunting and fishing, I love those things. I truly enjoy those things, but they're just not as important to me now as other things. It, you know, he says, remove from me vanity. It doesn't mean that these things that are enjoyable parts of life are necessarily bad in themselves, but their importance in our lives should really be in proportion to their importance altogether. Altogether. 
Remove from me emptiness. Deceit. Oh, deceit. You know, people that are lying to you constantly about what you should value most and what should be really important to you. Maybe we at no time in human history have experienced this kind of emptiness and deceit than human beings are experiencing right now in this election cycle. And then he says this. Protection from lies. God is able and willing to reveal the truth to it. We have to desire it, but we also need to learn to be content with it. And so we have contentedness here. He's praying for it. It's seen, by the way, contentedness is a gift from above. It focuses on pleasing God and avoiding the temptations that would turn us to him. Now, notice here, it's, uh, he talks about protection from lies, could be pain and other things. I have two slides out of order. And then here's what he, and so we'll talk about what is being content. It's being satisfied with what we have been given. Being satisfied that right now, in my life, apart from sinful habits or things like that, right now, in my life, right here is where God has me at, his, at this moment for His purposes. We ought to pray to be content. He is praying here to be content. He's saying, the writer here, as he looks at the rest of his life, I want to know the truth. I want things to be in proper proportion. I want to value the things that are valuable. I want to devalue the things that are not valuable. And I want to be content with that. I don't want to be deceived. In this passage, being content is a gift from God. He's asking God to help him see that. In this passage, contentedness is focused upon, meaning, uh, upon the importance of pleasing God and avoiding the temptations that might turn us from him. And this is where we come to this next section. He says here, these two, Lord, he, he says, Lord, give me wealth. Give me great wealth so I can give money to lots of people. Is that what he says? No. Janice Joplin, some of you folks know who she was. She said, Pastor, why are you quoting her in a message? She recorded a song, I think it was in the late 1960s. Oh Lord, why don't you give me a Mercedes Benz? Some of you remember that song. She was making fun of Christians that she had known in her life. Who saw their faith and God in heaven as as one that just pours out luxuries upon greedy believers. He says here, Lord, don't give me wealth. Notice first. He says, remove from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Why? Lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? (laughs) Isn't this an interesting thing? Let's go back to, okay, go back to problem solver. Are you the problem solver? Boy, I've got to fix the problem for tomorrow. Don't have enough money to pay this bill. Need to fix this problem. Need to do this thing. Need to you know, handle that problem. You, you know, life is a bunch of problems. You see, you see a, a, you know, something that is going great and wonderful, and the first thing you want to do is find out whatever the problem is and fix that little problem. You, you tend to start to become, uh, you know, in the very extreme perfectionist. And he says, listen, don't, Lord, don't give me wealth, because if you give me that and I get everything I want, I won't keep coming back to you. You remember what Jesus told the disciples? Give us this day our daily bread. There is something 
about recognizing your daily need for the Lord that keeps you in daily fellowship and daily dependence upon Him. And they're all you have sometimes, what happens is when you get everything you want, you have the illusion that you are not dependent upon Him. This is one of the wonderful things about being in an agricultural type of society. You know, these people were farmers. They put the, you know, they might have an irrigation system in certain parts of the world. You know, they had some in Egypt. But usually farmers, they have to put the seed in the ground. And, you know, every time you put that seed in the ground, you put it in faith. Because you can do one of two things with it. You can eat it. Or you can bury it. And if you bury it, you're trusting the fact that it's going to, that some animal's not going to eat it, that the rain's going to fall, that it's going to be enough rain, but it's not going to be too not much rain. It's not going to be hail that destroys the plant. It's not going to be a drought that, just, that destroys the plant. They're all different kinds of things. And so you, you, you know what you have to do in ancient times if you're a farmer? You put the seed in the ground and you pray. You have to pray. And see, many of you are looking at the very thing. See, this, there's something in your life, almost every one of you, that daily keeps you on your knees before your God dependent upon Him. And it is the thing that many of you think is the thing that has to be fixed in my life when it is the thing that He has purposefully put into your life to keep you connected to Him. He said, don't give me riches, lest I be content, and I deny you the food, by the way, the food necessary. He said, the danger, he says, here's, notice what he says, verse um. Uh, verse 7, he says, um, feed me with the food that is... Lord, here's what I'm asking. Just give me enough. All, all I need is enough. I, I don't have to have steaks. I just have to have enough. I don't have, have to have a refrigerator that is packed full and a pantry that is packed full, and bins that are full of all the rice and beans to take us through the next apocalypse. Lord, just, just give me enough. The food that is convenient for me, the food that is necessary for me. Why? Because I don't want to be full and deny you and say, I don't need God. This is one of the problems with an affluent society. The danger of poverty. Poverty. Here's what he says here. Lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my Lord in vain. Now, this is another temptation. And this is interesting because we have this temptation of, I want more, 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 and then I'll forget God. But there also there's this temptation of, I have particular needs. You, you do have to eat, and you do have to, and you are hungry, and you do want shelter, something over your head. You know, there are those basic necessities of life, and there is nothing wrong with praying and asking God to provide you with the basic necessities of life. He's doing it here in Proverbs. In fact, Jesus commanded the disciples to do that in the Lord's Prayer. And so there is this temptation of need. He says that there's the, there, there are the necessities, the true necessities of survival, and hunger can drive people to do lots of things. The writer here prays for them because he understands. Folks, when we talk about Jesus being tempted in the wilderness, Pastor Chris is going to preach that message here sometime soon. He had a human body. We talked about this earlier. He had a human body. Because he had a human body, he truly felt hunger. When Jesus, we talked about Jesus going to, uh, to Lazarus' funeral, and you know, when they're mourning Lazarus, he truly wept. Jesus had sorrow. Why? Those aren't sinful things. Those are, those are things just associated with the weaknesses of human flesh. 
And so the writer here prays regarding the weaknesses of his human flesh. That's why there's nothing wrong with play, praying for those things that are natural, normal, good desires for people to pray for. There is nothing wrong with, if you're single, praying for asking God to give you a husband or asking God to give you a wife. There's nothing wrong with praying for that. There's nothing wrong with asking Him for that. There's nothing wrong with asking God to put food on the table. There's nothing wrong with asking God to give you a child. There's nothing wrong with asking for those what would seem to be normal things in life. He says, don't give me poverty. This, he said, this, by the way, it can go beyond praying for the absolute necessities of life, to pray for normal necessities, or to pray for things that would be blessings, to ask God to bless. It's all right. I remember when we were going from the fourth child to the fifth child. And we, we came to the conclusion that having a little bit more square footage would really help in our house. We also were in the situation where my mom and dad had sold a house that had a pool. And we said, I remember telling them, why are you doing that? We're not going to have a pool anymore to come and swim in. And she said, we don't want one anymore. You find a house with a pool. <laughs> and, you, you know, it is... Having a pool is not an absolute necessity, right? But when you have five kids in Arizona in the summertime with nothing to do, it sure is a help. And sometimes it keeps you out of the funny farm. <laughs> because, you know, they need to be able to work off that energy somehow, some way. And so I remember praying for that. Now, uh, and I, I was really struggling. Am I being covetous? Now? Am I doing the wrong? You know, I'm just, am I? And, um, and I remember coming to the conclusion, okay, Lord, if you don't want us to switch or you want us to stay here, then we'll be content to stay here, whatever it was you want. And I think that's, I think that's the real answer to praying for those types of things is ask God and the, the test of covetousness is how you respond if he says no. The combination of these two prayers together is the essence of being content. Being satisfied with God's provision and not greedily always wanting more. For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? But what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? I think this is the essence of that first part of that prayer. Re remove from me emptiness and deceitfulness and let me focus upon the things in life that are most important. And that is, isn't it interesting here? Every one of these things are prayers that put this writer in closer relationship with his Lord. 